Hey, good afternoon. <laughs> welcome uh, once again, uh, especially for those of you who are just arriving. Welcome to the Weave News uh, 10th Anniversary Conference on Citizen Journalism as Activism. Welcome also to folks who are joining us on our global live stream this afternoon. Uh, we're very happy to have you here. We're on the campus of St. Lawrence University. This is a weekend of workshops, uh, panels, discussions, cultural activities uh, devoted to some of the intersections of citizen journalism and activism. And uh, we're celebrating 10 years of grassroots media making here at Weave News. My name is John Collins. I'm one of the founders of Weave News, and I also teach in the Global Studies Department here at St. Lawrence. Uh, before I introduce our keynote speaker today, just a few quick announcements about sort of where we are in the conference right now and what's coming up. Uh, there's a round of workshops right after the keynote lecture starting at 2.45. One of those workshops, uh, the one on uh, activist sticker making with Kathy Tedford, uh, wanted to announce that Kathy's over there. Uh, that workshop is actually going to be held in the Brush Art Gallery uh, here on the St. Lawrence campus. And uh, if you need to find out where that is, we've got some maps upstairs, or you can ask anybody who's from St. Lawrence here. Uh, so if you'd like to attend that workshop, make sure you head on over to the Brush Gallery uh, after this lecture, and then come on back, because uh, just after 4 o'clock, we have two outstanding panels. Uh, one of them is on the theme of activism and storytelling. And the second one is uh, about the Weaving the Streets and People's History Archive project. Uh, which is an ongoing project documenting the wide variety of creative ways in which people around the world use public space to express themselves culturally and politically. Following that, we'll, uh, we'll be here for dinner, uh, a reception first, and dinner to, to officially celebrate 10 years of Weave News. And then we'll be over at the Launders Underground starting at 8 o'clock tonight for what promises to be a fantastic concert by Taina Asili y la Banda Rebelde, and they'll be treating us to the rhythm of rebellion. Uh, and if you uh, know any folks who are around here who might be interested in that, please spread the word. It's going to be a great concert and uh, a great way to, um, to end a fantastic day here at the conference. So it's a great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for this conference, Dr. Bill Guzman. Dr. Usman earned his doctorate in communication from the University of Massachusetts Amherst, and he's the former managing director of the Media Education Foundation and the current director of the graduate program in media literacy and digital culture at Sacred Heart University, where he's an assistant professor in the School of Communications and Media Arts. Uh, this is a new graduate program. Uh, from what I understand, there two St. Lawrence, recent St. Lawrence graduates who are now studying in that graduate program. So we have a little, a little bit of a pipeline going there, which we would like to keep wide open. Uh, and so if you're interested in media issues, uh, I encourage you to speak with Bill or with uh, Lori Bindig, who's here as well, from the same program, um, and they'll tell you all about that, that fantastic graduate program. Uh, Bill's research focuses on media literacy education, and the construction of racial ideologies in media images and narratives. He's published numerous essays in peer-reviewed journals and anthologies. Um, and his first book, Primetime Prisons on US Television, Representations of Incarceration, was published in 2009. And his most recent book is The Spike Lee Enigma, Challenges and Incorporation, sorry, Challenge and Incorporation in Media Culture. Uh, published in 2014. Along with several, several of my Weave News colleagues, I was fortunate to be able to attend the 2016 uh, conference hosted by the uh, Action Coalition for Media Education uh, that was held at Sacred Heart University. And uh, Bill and his colleagues at ACME welcomed us with open arms, and we're excited to be a part of this growing network of critical media educators and practitioners. And we're absolutely thrilled that Bill accepted our invitation to speak at this conference. Today he'll be talking about clinging to sanity, the urgent need for critical media literacy in the post-truth society. So please join me in welcoming uh, to the Weave News 10th Anniversary Conference, Dr. Bill Usman.
Hi, everybody. I was uh, really honored to get John's invitation uh, to speak here today. I met John a couple years ago, and uh, I guess I made a good impression, which, you know, I don't always do. Uh, so when he reached out to me, I, I was really thrilled. Uh, and, and I really consider it a real honor. This is a great conference, and I'm really happy to be a part of it. Before we really get into uh, the topic today, I'd like to just acknowledge the victims of the Bowling Green Massacre. I, I hear some of you laughing. I'm, that seems really cold-hearted to me. I mean, if you don't if you don't know about the Bowling Green Massacre, I think that really reveals the problems of our media system. Kelly and Con Conway told us several times about the Bowling Green Massacre. In fact, she mentioned this three times in the space of media interviews last February. And she pointed out, right, that there wasn't very much coverage of it. And, and that's why people didn't know that it happened. Of course, another explanation for why people didn't know that it happened is because it didn't happen. There was no Bowling Green massacre. The New York Times is currently tracking every lie told by the President of the United States. And they update it periodically. And you can just scroll and scroll. Keep in mind that this is a compendium of lies told only by him. It doesn't include lies told by his staff, his spokespeople, or sympathetic media outlets. And there are a couple points I want to make about this. First, this pattern of lies from a U.S. president is both exceptional and unexceptional. Second, we were warned about the dangers of this sort of deceptive despotism many years ago. We'll get to the second point a little bit later, but but first, I want to complicate without entirely dismissing the notion that because the president lies to us almost every day, and other powerful institutions are lying to us, and much of our media system can't be trusted, and we're surrounded by so-called fake news, despite all of that, I want to complicate this idea that we've entered a brand new era. You know, something that we're calling the post-truth era. There are a spate of new and forthcoming books that are making this argument, or a similar argument that the country has lost its collective mind. And I myself use the terms clinging to sanity and post-truth in the title of this talk today. Post-truth was named the word of the year by Oxford. There's even a children's book that you can purchase on Amazon. <laughs> I'll give you a second to... <laughs> he, he, he was asking me, what, what's the problem? I don't know why I just picked on you. That's what you get for sitting close to me. I just want to read you the little description. In this baby's first words picture book designed for the post-truth era, your little one will get a head start on the skills needed to survive in a world where facts don't matter. Is that really a picture of a cat? You decide. That's the beauty of living in a post-truth society. As long as you believe it, your baby will too. Hmm. 
with over 30 full-color photographs accompanied by wildly inaccurate, or fully accurate, who's to say, vocabulary words, this book will help prepare your child for a world in which everything and nothing is true. But here's the point that I want to make. We have to become comfortable enough with our cognitive dissonance to hold two ideas in our heads at the same time. First, that presidents and powerful forces and media always tell lies. They always have, and they always will. The fiercely independent journalist I.F. Stone reminded us of this in the 1960s. And if we take even a quick glance through history, we see that he was right. History will allow us to put today's lies into context so that we can see what's both ordinary and exceptional about this at the same time. So just a, a quick tour through a few touchstones. At the end of the 19th century, an American painter and illustrator, Frederick Remington, was sent to Cuba by the newspaper publisher William Randolph Hearst. The intent was him for him to send back illustrations covering conflict in Cuba. But when Remington get, got there, he didn't, he didn't find conflict. So he sent Hearst a telegram asking if he could come home. He wrote, everything is quiet, there's no trouble, there will be no war, I wish to return. And Hearst's immediate response was, please remain. You furnish the pictures, I'll furnish the war. That was in 1898, and of course, they did. In Stalin's Soviet Union, long before Photoshop, people who fell out of favor were disappeared, both in reality and in the photographic evidence that suggested that they ever existed at all. In 1964, Based on spurious reports of an event that never happened, Congress passed the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, which gave President Johnson really broad powers in responding to what was described as North Vietnamese aggression. More recently, after 9-11, the New York Times was complicit with the Bush administration in leading us into war based on false reports and allegations. Surely, this was an example of fake news, if anything is. Currently, it's not uncommon for media pundits to make false claims about social justice activists without any real evidence to support these claims. When Fox News repeatedly frames a peaceful protest movement as terrorist. This has to be understood as fake news, <laughs> or the concept itself has no meaning at all. So we should think about fake news as something that's always been with us. And we also need to think about how fake news has functioned as both propaganda and entertainment simultaneously. Because the best propaganda is entertainment. And the ways that propaganda and entertainment can blur together and be mutually reinforcing is also something that we should take note of. A classic fake news outlet like the National Enquirer has recently made a move toward flat-out propaganda. So in many ways, the idea that the president is lying and the media are complicit in these lies is nothing new. It's unexceptional. And yet, I would argue that there is something different about the era that we're currently living in. There's something both unexceptional and exceptional about what we're experiencing. 
There's another part to that I.F. Stone quote that I didn't show you. There's a clause that follows after all governments lie. <laughs> and even though he wrote this in 1967 with the Vietnam War raging, I think there is something particularly apt about this quote in today's context. I would argue that while we are being drugged, those who are leading us are also taking the same drugs. They believe their own lies, or they convince themselves to believe those lies after they tell them. I think Trump and his officials and his supporters really do believe that America was once great, and that if we would just shut up and get out of the way, they can return it to those glorious days when women and minorities knew their place and the ideologies of capitalism and American exceptionalism were just accepted as hegemonic common sense. As the musician Gil Scott Heron once wrote, first one wants freedom, then the whole damn world wants freedom. We know that the myths that they're promulgating are lies. But I would argue that they don't. I would argue that when Kellyanne Conway starts talking about a terrorist attack that never happened and she gets caught, she's just annoyed because she believes that whether it happened or not is just a detail. And what she's talking about is reflective of some greater truth. And that's why any ideas or facts that challenge this administration can simply be written off as fake news. We know what Trump and his supporters mean by this. We know that it has nothing to do with truth or facts or reality. We know that this really means any information or idea that challenges them, that questions them, that holds them accountable. What makes this vexing and complicated, though, is that fake news is indeed a real problem. You've probably heard about what they're calling Pizzagate. Right, where this person read online that Hillary Clinton was running a sex trade operation out of the basement of a DC pizza shop, and he showed up with guns to free the sex slaves. And this is a global phenomenon. A recent article in the journal New Media and Society by three researchers um, is called The Agenda-Setting Power of Fake News. And I just want to read you a, a, a short quote from this. In late 2016, as the US Election Day approached, fake news gained growing public interest. In November and December, more people Googled the phrase than the combined previous 15 months. Now, fake news can be produced purposefully by teenagers in the Balkans or entrepreneurs in the United States seeking to make money from advertising. Hundreds of websites have popped up around the internet that appear credible at face value but are fake in nature. But I would also say that we need to both broaden and depersonalize our understanding of what fake news is. Fake news is not simply news that I disagree with. Those of us on the left are prone to being deluded by fake news just as those on the right are. Fake news is not any news that comes from alternative or non-mainstream sources, which is what Facebook's filtering algorithm might suggest. 
alternative and independent news sources are often our best hope in a media environment that is dominated by corporate power. Although, of course, here, we have to do careful vetting before we decide to trust a report that's forwarded to us from a random website or a blog. And as I've already suggested, fake news is not some new phenomena that just emerged with the 2016 presidential campaign. In fact, we're a culture that's been awash in fake news for decades. This is, in fact, the soil that the Trump movement grew. When this is what passes for news for many Americans, we have to recognize that what the people at Project Censored call junk food news is closely related to what we're now bemoaning as fake news. Junk food news is a phrase that was coined by one of the founders of Project Censored, Carl Jensen, where he's <coughs> called it, you know, sensationalized, personalized, homogenized, inconsequential trivia passed off as news because it's cheap to produce and profitable for media proprietors. And when I think about junk food news, I'm reminded of a familiar name in critical media studies. And invoking this name is going to allow me to move to my second key point, which is that we have indeed been warned about the consequences of our debased media culture that we now are finally warned about. Many of you are probably familiar with Neil Postman's classic argument about media and culture from a 1985 book called Amusing Ourselves to Death. And the title actually says it all. Right? Postman stated his thesis, and, and this is a quote, Our politics, religion, news, athletics, education, and commerce have been transformed into congenial adjuncts of show business largely without protest or even much popular notice. The result is that we are a people on the verge of amusing ourselves to death. He wrote this in 1985. And as Emily Nussbaum wrote recently on the New Yorker's website, and this is a quote from her, Trump is president because of television. He was elected because of the reality distortion effect that was the Emmy-nominated The Apprentice. He was elected using comedy, framing lies as jokes, making them harder to fight because you always lose when you complain about jokes. And just last February, Postman's son wrote a piece for The Guardian where he said his father had in fact foretold the rise of the Trump era. But of course, here too, we should put this into some historical context. There is a historical precedent for this. I'm sure you know that Ronald Reagan was a bad Hollywood actor before he was a bad US president. And to quote from Gil Scott Heron's song, Be Movie, one more time, I remember what I said about Reagan meant it, acted like an actor, holly weird, acted like a liberal, acted like General Franco when he acted like governor of California, then he acted like a Republican, then he acted like somebody was going to vote for him for president, and now we act like 26% of the registered voters is actually a mandate. We're all actors in this, I suppose. Still, still quite relevant, I would say. But to return to Postman, keeping in mind the importance of Postman's warning, right, because 
Postman in Amusing Ourselves to Death refers to two dystopian novels, 1984 by George Orwell and Brave New World by Aldous Huxley. And he makes the argument that whereas Orwell's novel predicted a society ruled by pain and coercion, Huxley's novel predicted a society ruled by distraction and that we had more to fear from Huxley's vision than we did from Orwell's vision. Keeping in mind the importance of this, I also want to provoke a little bit. And I want to make an argument that people who know me might find really surprising. And this is what I want to argue. So what could I possibly mean by this? First, Trump was right when he said fake news is the enemy of the people. From that same study of fake news and agenda, citing, and agenda setting that I cited earlier, a quote, fake news spreads on social media and is perhaps more popular than ever. Previous research has shown that American adults are susceptible to fake news headlines. Fake news distorts breaking news and may even disrupt global politics. Our study confirms that content generated from fake news sites is on the rise and furthers our understanding of fake news by addressing its ability to push or drive the popularity of issues in the broader online media ecosystem. Such a rapid rise in fake news content generation is problematic. They, they said it a little bit better than he did. <laughs> and then there's this, which, which this, this might be even more blasphemous in some circles than the first thing. <coughs> but I mean something very specific about this. So Postman says, Orwell feared that what we fear will ruin us. Huxley feared that what we desire will ruin us. This book is about the possibility that Huxley, not Orwell, was right. And specifically, what I want to argue is that Postman was wrong to diminish and dismiss Orwell's nightmarish vision too quickly. Don't get me wrong, I do agree that as a culture, we have been mystified, distracted, and pacified by the mindless media that Postman decried. But where I think he got it wrong was in his critique of the dystopian vision of George Orwell. I think we have to be very aware that it's not only what we love that will ruin us. It's not just a Huxleyan nightmare that we find ourselves in. Orwell's vision of what we hate as the source of our ruin also has to be wrestled with. Otherwise, we run the risk of just simply blaming the victim. Blaming those who allow themselves to be cowed by Big Brother while letting Big Brother himself off the hook. We know, for example, that Big Brother really is watching us. We know that his forces are torturing those that they consider enemies. We know that they are imprisoning, intimidating, and silencing political dissidents. We know that war has become a permanent state of affairs and that we're waging these endless wars all around the globe. And that yesterday's friends are today's enemies and today's friends will be tomorrow's enemies. 
just as Orwell said. We know that according to this administration and their corporate and military bedfellows, that ignorance indeed is strength. And we know that there are no qualms about using violence to back up their rhetoric. As Orwell wrote toward the end of 1984, So, what do we do? How do we respond? What possibilities are there in a world where both Huxley's vision of a society distracted and placated and Orwell's vision of a society controlled by surveillance and coercion are coming to fruition in more ways than we might imagine? How do we fight this? It has to start with reasserting the value of truth and focusing on how we get to the truth. And this is why media is of central concern. This is a quote from a former FCC commissioner, Nicholas Johnson. He also wrote, there were a lot of activist movements during the 1960s and 70s. Anti-war, pro-environment, the rights of women and African Americans, among others. Their individual first priorities. As a commissioner of the Federal Communications Commission during those years, the way in which those movements were impacted by the role of the mainstream media and the rules by which commercial media operated and was regulated became very clear. Or to put this another way, by the author Raul Martinez, the power of voters is dependent on what they know. Information is the oxygen of democracy. Its health depends on the quality of the ideas and facts circulating through society. If voters can be systematically misled, they can be systematically manipulated. As the independent journalist Glenn Greenwald writes, a key purpose of journalism is to provide an adversarial check on those who wield the greatest power by shining a light on what they do in the dark and informing the public about those acts. And then, Back to Orwell, journalism is printing what someone else does not want printed. Everything else is public relations. And this is why we have to resist the post-truth society. We used to think that truth was straightforward. In the enlightenment sense of truth, anything that can be empirically verified is simply what is true. Postmodern social theory came along and they spoiled all of that. Because we now know truth is contextual. It's co-constructed amongst all of us. It's multi-perspectival. Your truth is not the same as my truth. These are actually very important insights from postmodern theory. But we also have to retain some sense of truth as not being so ethereal that it simply melts into air. There are indeed some truths that persist external to our perceptions and points of view. 
There are truths out there, even if the media we rely on the most shy away from them. Refuse to speak them. As the science fiction author Philip K. Dick noted, reality is that which, when you stop believing in it, doesn't go away. Climate change doesn't care if you believe in it or not. So we have to be able to hold both the modern and postmodern sense of truth in our heads at the same time. Yes, our understanding of what is real is subjective, but reality does still exist. And we have to challenge media that create misleading discourses and spread disinformation that have real effects on public opinion and public policy. By way of example, this is what passes for mainstream news. powerful and scary images that actually don't reflect reality very well. There's a recent article by three researchers from Georgia State University that show that when we dig into some actual facts, we get a much different picture than that implied by Newsweek and numerous other so-called mainstream <coughs> news outlets that while most terrorist attacks are not committed by Muslim people, you would never get that sense from our corporate media. They go on to point out that attacks by Muslim perpetrators received on average 449% more coverage than other attacks, even though more of the attacks were by non-Muslim perpetrators. False narratives like this must be challenged. And increasingly, we have the tools to do this. We also have access to media technology now. One clever artist actually did this on Twitter. Because we have to recognize that media are a form of pedagogy. They teach us about the world. We have to fight the, dis the debasement of our media culture as a battle over education. If we consider post-truth to be a crisis, it's a crisis about what we know and how we think. It's a crisis of political rhetoric and media distortions. It's a crisis of education. And this is where critical media literacy enters the picture. With the emphasis on critical. As Funk, Kellner, and Cher wrote, critical media literacy calls for examining the hierarchical power relations that are embedded in all communication and that ultimately benefit dominant social groups at the expense of subordinated ones. Influenced by Marxism and the Frankfurt School and British Cultural Studies, critical media literacy goes beyond more conservative approaches to media education by starting with the recognition that media perform not just as information or entertainment, but even more crucially as the voice of the powerful in society. And critical media literacy adopts the position that this voice can and should be challenged by alternative voices. So advocating for justice and social transformation is really central to a critical media literacy approach. By examining their ideological assumptions, 
students can learn to question what they consider normal or common sense. Common sense is only so because ideas and texts have been produced and disseminated through a dominant frame of thought expressed in powerful master narratives, often conveyed through media, schools, government, religion, and families. Education is always a political act. The critical education scholar Ira Shore wrote, not encouraging students to question knowledge, society, and experience tacitly endorses and supports the status quo. The insights of critical pedagogy make it plain that the idea of neutral education is a myth. As the scholar Bell Hooks notes, we can either teach with the grain or against the grain, but either choice is a political choice. And this doesn't entail telling students what political party they should vote for or what ballot initiative they should support. It involves engaging students in a process of critical questioning of received wisdom. The process of questioning, researching, introspection, dialogue, that's the point, rather than some predetermined outcome that all students are expected to embrace. It's interesting that since the election, even the major media corporations are starting to realize the need for heightened levels of media literacy. CNN calling for media literacy. CNN. Of course, this isn't the type of media literacy that I'm advocating for. CNN, owned by Time Warner, is not interested in a type of critical media literacy education that challenges the power of big, profit-oriented media conglomerates. There are also well-meaning media literacy organizations that don't quite get it either. The National Association of Media Literacy Education is the nation's largest predominant media literacy organization. And yet, they take funding from Nickelodeon, Twitter, Facebook. You can't be funded by big media companies and simultaneously challenge and confront big media companies. It's impossible. And keep in mind that what I'm advocating for isn't easy. This is a long-term fight. All of this can start to feel very depressing. And some turn away from a critical approach because of that. But in the end, I believe that critical media literacy is essentially an optimistic project. Because it's focused on change and transformation. We have to recognize the problems for first. And this can be grim. But only after doing so can we begin to address them. And I take inspiration in this quote from Henry Giroux. While it's true that critical thinking will not in and of itself change the nature of existing society, engaging in an intellectual struggle with the death-driven rationality that now fuels neoliberal capitalism will set the foundation for producing generations of young people who might launch a larger social movement. Maybe some of the people in the room right now. Such a movement will enable new forms of struggle and it can be hoped a new future in which questions of justice, dignity, equality, and compassion matter. Rather than political indoctrination, 
the approach that I'm advocating for should be recognized as unavoidable for anyone who advocate for forms of literacy that enable free thinking, even in the face of tidal waves of governmental and corporate propaganda. That's the critical in critical media literacy. And the good news is that there's lots of movement in this direction already. There are critical media literacy scholars and educators and artists and journalists and organizations and activists that are already fighting this fight. Again, people in this room. This conference is a prime example of this. And let me just highlight quickly a few others. There's the Action Coalition for Media Education, which challenges this idea that you can accept funding from media organizations and at the same time have an autonomous critical approach. There's Project Censor, who I mentioned a few minutes ago. Founded over 40 years ago, they every year fight the fight to bring news and information that has been ignored by corporate media to light. Together, ACME and Project Censored have formed the Global Critical Media Literacy Project, which is intended to bring students and faculty together in challenging corporate media and creating their own media. I know later on today, someone is gonna be leading a session on this. There's the Media Education Foundation, where I used to work that create video documentaries that are meant to challenge and to present alternative perspectives. There's Free Press, which is a more reform-oriented organization working within to try to change the corporate structure of the media environment that we live in. There's the Union for Democratic Communications, which is a group of scholars and activists that come together to fight for a more open, diverse, and democratic media system. And of course, there's Weave News. And this is just a small sample of the work that's being done. There's all kinds of independent people out there doing this kind of work. So we have to remain optimistic, even in the face of grim news. I'd like to end with the following quote from Noam Chomsky. Asked in a February 2016 interview about hope for the future, Chomsky said this, we have two choices. We can be pessimistic, give up, and help ensure that the worst will happen. Or we can be optimistic, grasp the opportunities that surely exist, and maybe help make the world a better place. Not much of a choice. And in keeping with the idea of the post-truth society, I lied when I said this was going to be the last talk. <laughs> I actually have one more idea that I'd like to wrap up with. This is a long-term engagement that involves many fronts. I've mentioned the first three in this talk today, but it really would be remiss to not acknowledge the role of the arts in combating lies and deception. And we've already seen a lot of that here at this conference, whether it's documentary filmmakers, or musicians, or poets. The art world is also fighting this battle. And so I really see these as working in combination with one another. So my actual final thought 
is taken from the words of one of my favorite poets. The year that I was born, William Carlos Williams wrote, it is difficult to get the news from poems, yet men die miserably every day for lack of what's found there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bill. Thank you for um, thank you for being rigorous. Uh, thank you for giving us a uh, sort of living example of um, depth of thinking. Thank you for being optimistic. Um, and hopeful. Right? Many of you who know me know that I love that quote from Woody Guthrie about keeping your hoping machine running. So, you put some fuel on our, the engine of our hoping machine today, Bill. Um, we have some time for questions, and I'm going to exercise my prerogative as MC here, and I'd like us to begin by getting a couple of questions uh, from students, please. And Lukash, one of our Weave News staffers, is here with the microphone, and we're going to get a couple questions from students, and then Bill can respond, and then we'll uh, We'll open things up a bit more. We do have um, maybe 10, 15 minutes for that before we move on to the next set of workshops. So students, this is your moment. There we go. Any question that starts with why are you so awesome would be, <laughs> would be a great way to start. Uh, I'm just saying. Thank you for being here. Um, I really enjoyed this uh, presentation. I was just wondering, um, I'm actually hoping to work on uh, a project for my SYE that kind of pertains to the media. I was wondering in terms of sources, uh, especially the ones that you used about like the amount of Muslim um, media coverage in terms of attacks versus like how many are actually perpetrated by Muslims. Um, I was wondering where you kind of got that information and how you went about like just um, and, and if you have more information just uh, on that particular topic. Well, you didn't start that with... <laughs> no, that's an excellent question because sourcing is really important. And I think sourcing is actually at the heart of the problem that we're facing. And this, this is why I, I, I just mentioned briefly, it's, it's not an ideological thing. Like, I think people across the ideological spectrum are prone to falling for bad information because we have an, an inherent bias that we, we like things that we already agree with. And it's easy to, to find something that we already agree with and say, oh, okay, this, this must be true. So, so sourcing is really important. So I think my main advice would be make sure you're using vetted sources. You know, sources that have gone through some type of review by reliable organizations and people. I think that's one of the real values to what Weave News is doing, to what Project Censor is doing. They, you know, when they talk about unreported stories or when they cover things that corporate media are not covering, they're also really rigorous in checking the sourcing of this. You'll never find you know, a story you know, on Project Sensitive's list of the most unreported stories that don't have a range of sources to back it up. Um, the particular study that I referred to, um, that's an academic study. You know, that was one that was you know, done by academic researchers at Georgia State University and that um, had to go through peer review, you know, to, to make sure that what they were reporting was reliable before it actually appeared. So, you know, that's that's one thing that I would re re recommend to students. Try to use, you know, peer review sources that, that provide some backup. This doesn't mean that it's all going to be pristine. That doesn't mean you should trust anything. 
that appears in a peer-reviewed journal, but just in general, like this idea of vetted sources, you know, so that there's some there's some check uh, for the credibility of what you're seeing. Um, so, if you're looking for that particular uh, study, I think if you I think if you Google <laughs> Google, um, but that's that's where we start these days. Um, Overrepresentation of Muslim perpetrators, and then Georgia State University, you'll find that particular piece. And then another bit of advice that I give to my own students is, if you find a piece of research that you think is supported and vetted and reliable, look at what they're citing. Go to their list of citations, and you can start to you know, kind of do this snowball thing where you look at their sources and then you look at the sources that their sources are using and you can start to kind of build this web of, you know, reliability. Wow, there's more students. Um, where do you get your news, like on a regular basis and why? I'm a big fan of uh, Breitbart. <laughs> so that, that's also an excellent question, even though you still didn't start it the right way. Uh, but um, I personally try to make sure that I look at a wide variety of sources. So I think it's useful to be skeptical of corporate media, but not cynical. And, and so I really see a difference there. That cynical would say, you can't trust anything reported in the New York Times. Whereas skeptical says, I understand the problems of the New York Times, I know the history of the New York Times, but it's still the considered kind of like the major news source in the US and throughout much of the world. So I need to pay attention to what is in the New York Times. Right? Even though I might look at it with some skepticism, I still need to know what they're covering. So I look at the New York Times. Um, same thing for you know other big media outlets like the Washington Post, things like that. But then I don't think you can stop there. Then I, then I think you need to look for other perspectives. And I think you need to look for international perspectives. So see what, how the story is covered by the BBC, or the Canadian Broadcasting Service, or Al Jazeera, or other outlets in the Middle East, or Africa, or Asia. And then I think there's also a range of reliable, independent media online that is easier to find than ever before. So on a regular basis, I read things like The Intercept, which is an online news source, um, Democracy Now, the Amy Goodman program. I do listen to public radio, even though I have lots of issues um, with public radio as well. But I really try to look at a range of sources. I pay attention to salon.com online. Um, I look at um, something called the Black Agenda Report. You know, some of these are big organizations, some of these are small organizations, um, but I think the, the main thing is to use a variety of sources, both dominant, so-called mainstream, and independent, alternative, and international. So my turn. 
Um, you rock. <laughs> Finally, someone has started their question the right way. Um, I'm wondering, as you said, that it's a battle over education and us as um, students and kind of educators in our own community. How can we, on an individual level, level or in the classroom or outside of the classroom, we're just chatting with your friends, how can we be more critical and um, become the people who are educating each other? Another excellent question. There's a great group of students here. Um, well, I think it starts with my answer to the previous question, which is that in your own life, rely on a variety of sources of information. Don't stop just at whatever pops up in your social media field, feed. feed. Um, because I think I think both young people and and too often like we we want to suggest that these trends are only happening with young people when in fact really 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 old people like myself <laughs> are, are are fall prone to the same kind of cultural moment. I think young people and older people alike sometimes they stop at whatever just happens to pop up on their Facebook feed. And they, don't, and they don't go any further than that. And there's even been some research that they don't even go past the headlines that pop up on their Facebook feed. Right? So if you really want to understand a story, you've got to read the whole story, not just you know, the headline. Uh, because often headlines are really misleading um, in terms of what's actually being reported in the body of the story. But so I would say it starts there, right? With with making sure that you're relying on a variety of sources, and that you're relying on a variety of reliable sources, and that you're not just mindlessly forwarding on things to other people that maybe shouldn't be trusted, because that that's that's part of how this happens. That that that's part of how truth gets distorted that one person finds something that's just completely and totally misleading, but then they forward it to 20 of their friends, and they forward it to 100 of their friends, and next thing you know, like it's taken on this, this false veneer as if it's actually something to be relied on. So I think using a variety of sources, making sure you're reading thoroughly and deeply and with a critical perspective, and then communicating those ideas to other people and sharing with other people the sources that, that you are finding useful and reliable and why you find those sources useful and reliable. I think that's the way to start. As we are all students throughout life, let's open the floor to everyone for one more question. Who will be the slappy person? <laughs> Uh, thanks for your presentation. Um, learned a lot. Uh, I'm from China, and uh, news are like censorship is a huge thing. And I was talking to Quester about his film making, like um, in China, like how whether it's going to premiere in China or overseas is going to change the content. Um, so for, and also like language, translation is a huge thing for, you know, like English is an entrance to basically critical media literacy. Like you have to be literate or in a way that it's, it's like a standard, I, I'm assuming. Like, um, so I'm also curious of, of how, like the modern day, how the youth is choosing news based on, as you said, more passively, or the way it's fragmented, and like, you know, the use of Facebook and Twitter, like, the content is already simplified or shortened. Like, how to address a critical and thoroughly in-depth um, questions, or like, you know, investigations to an audience that who already kind of conditioned to like, oh, you know, this postmodern or like this way of 
selecting news in a more like a fast food um, style, I guess. Um, Yeah, there's, there's a lot there. Um, let me start with, like, it, it is true that in China, for example, there is actually official state censorship of media, uh, which Google, by the way, has been complicit with. Um, and Rupert Murdoch and his news outfits have been complicit with as well because they see it as a tremendous you know, market that they can tap into. But I also think that censorship happens uniquely in different international situations and that the U.S. itself experiences a lot of censorship that we don't think of as censorship and that there is censorship by government fiat, and then there's censorship by intimidation. There's censorship by seeking high profits instead of really doing the job of informing people. So there's certain stories that we're not gonna cover because either they're too dangerous or because we don't think that they're going to make a profit. Or you'll also hear people in corporate media in the United States say, well, it's too complicated a story. Right? And, and so like, it's too complicated for us to explain this to the public. So it's easier just not, not to cover it at all. So I, I think censorship is really a concern all over the globe whether it's in a totalitarian situation or whether it's in a uh, supposedly democratic open society. I'm trying to think of what the second part of your question was. Um, I think it's like, um, according to like the youth audience that we're, we're trying to be more critical like in education, their news consumption like um, but the way you know I feel like the uh, how we consume news is already fragmented and like uh, you know chipped in segments you know uh, the consumer is definitely way more passive than in a more active way of choosing you know consciously thinking of sourcing and you know like um, all the all the steps that we've been talking about, like how to address all of the, these issues in a content in a in a platform that is already designed for fragmentation and passive. Right, right. No, that, that that's an excellent point. And you know, the uh, media scholar named Marshall McLuhan really believed that the technology that we're using plays a, a crucial role in determining the impact and the effects of the media that we're using. And I think you're absolutely right that things like social media or consuming media on a portable device, you know, while you're you know running from one place to another, that all feeds this idea of kind of a distracted, fragmented um, kind of public which are not really investigating things in depth. I think I think we, we have to make a conscious effort to push back against that. I think we have to make a con conscious effort to check, check ourselves and, and you know, find that when you've been reading something and you find your attention wandering after three or four minutes, that that's not really a deficiency of you, that that's actually the way this media is designed to operate, right? So that you don't stay on anything for too long, and that it's constantly going from this to that to that, and really developing a type of uh, mindfulness and consciousness about fighting against those trends and sticking with it and allowing yourself to, to read more in depth 
and allowing yourself to think about things in a, in a complicated way beyond just your first reaction to it. I, I do think that that also is a matter of education um, and making people aware of why fragmented media attention might be a problem and becoming conscious and aware enough to really resist that yourself, if that answers your question. I think we need to uh, leave it there for now. Please join me once again in, in thanking our keynote speaker for a fabulous lecture. <laughs> said this morning about the importance of listening when you're, when you're doing um, creative work and documentary film work and, and so forth that it starts with listening and taking the time to slow down to listen to slow down to read um, I think that's a really fundamental point in, in this context um, a couple of quick announcements again in case you didn't hear before the workshops that are coming up now uh, the sticker making workshop which many of you may be interested in is being held just a short walk away at the brush art gallery uh, and again, if you're not familiar where that is, there's some maps upstairs or you can ask anybody who's a St. Lawrence person here. Um, the Connecting Citizens to the Story workshop with Allison Butler is right upstairs in the conference room. We moved it up there from, from down here in order to be able to set things up for dinner um, down here. And then there's a News Analysis 101 workshop that I'll be leading that's in, uh, in Evan South uh, down here. Um, last thing I wanted to mention, uh, especially for the students here, if you're, if you're finding yourself um, responding to the conversation we've just been having by, by thinking, okay, well, what, um, you know, what can I do? Um, I would be remiss if I didn't say a little bit about what you can do with Read News, right? which, is, which is our local independent media uh, alternative here. So, um, first of all, if you've been involved in Read News with um, with Weave News in any way, raise your hand. Shout out to my weavers. <laughs> right. All of those folks can tell you a lot about how you can get involved, but I want to say specifically a few things. One, um, you can read, you can respond, you can follow our stories, you can share them, you can use social media to share them with other people, to tell your friends, take the time to read this piece. It was written by, in many cases, someone their age, or maybe a little bit older. Um, you can report and investigate stories that you care about. Stories in your community, larger stories, stories that connect your community with larger stories. Um, I'll give you some examples of themes that we're especially interested in right now that you may want to think about investigating. Uh, stories related to migration. Stories related to climate change and climate justice. Stories related to policing and incarceration and alternatives to the current system that we have in place. So if you have ideas about what you'd like to report on, come to us. We'll work with you. We'll provide you with the resources that we can, the training that we can. You can volunteer to, to be part of the organization. Right? There's an on-campus organization. Uh, we have a large organization that includes our alumni. Uh, we have an editorial committee, we have people doing social media, uh, we have people working on organizational development, what's the future of Weave News, thinking 10 years out, uh, planning events, you know, whatever you know, skills you have and interests you have, we can find a place for you. Um, obviously, uh, we're independent, we don't take that money from Twitter or Nickelodeon, um, although we do take money from the Mellon Foundation, and we thank them for that. Um, you can donate or you can encourage those who you know who might be in a position to donate to do so. Um, and we appreciate that. And if you have other ideas, just connect with us. Um, find us online, talk to us here at the conference, um, and uh, your voices are important. We'd love to have you involved. So thank you once again to Bill. Uh, thank you all of you for attending the keynote lecture. Hope you'll stick around for the next round of workshops, the panels to come after that. Great conversation and celebration over dinner and great music tonight with Taina Asili at 8 o'clock in the underground. Thank you again. And thanks to those who joined us on the live stream today.